Today is uh, Lincoln's Day. It's a uniquely Hingham holiday. It commemorates the birthdays of both Benjamin Lincoln, who was a major general in the Revolutionary War. He was born in 1733, about 1,500 feet from here. And Abraham Lincoln, who was born, of course, February 12th, 1809. He wasn't born here. However, his direct descendants came from Hingham, England, and were among the founders of Hingham, and are related to the same Lincolns. So it's a uniquely Hingham holiday. It's a Saturday between both births in January and in February. And we've been doing this for over 40 years now. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Day 2023, our 46th such commemoration. In the 342nd year of this meeting house, which was built in 1681, in the 388th year of our town, which was incorporated in 1635, as we celebrate Abraham Lincoln's 214th birthday and in even 290 years for Benjamin Lincoln, born 1733. Did you know that there are people out there who don't like history because it has too many dates? I can't imagine, I can't imagine why, but just in case, I want you to know I have now gotten them all out of the way. On Lincoln Day, we remember two famous Lincolns with Hingham roots. Benjamin Lincoln, Major General in the Continental Army and lifelong Hingham resident, and Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president and a descendant of Samuel Lincoln, who emigrated to this town in 1637. Oh, another date. On Lincoln Day, we pause to think about our local history in all of its complexity. Too often, our historical focus is narrow, and we overlook the experiences, the joys and pains, and the contributions of all those who have lived here. Too often we forget that what we now call Hingham was the home of indigenous people for many generations before the English settled here. And so today we want to acknowledge that this meeting house, the cemetery behind us, the historical society's three buildings and the streets we will walk after this ceremony are located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts. We pay respect to the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land which remains sacred to them. Finally, on Lincoln Day, we honor civic engagement, looking not only at the public service of the two Lincolns for inspiration, but also all of those who participate in our towns and our nation's enduring democratic institutions. So as we get started, I just want to offer a few thank yous. I want to thank Ed Acorn, today's Lincoln Day speaker, who I'll introduce more fully in a few minutes. I want to thank the congregation of First Parish for hosting us today, and to organist Chris Nicholson Mann for the music. I want to thank Reverend Steve Asello, who I am standing in front of awkwardly, of New North Church, who graciously agreed to preside over today's commemoration and to the parishioners of New North, who will have their church open to us and will be serving some warm drinks up in Fountain Square after the ceremony. Benjamin Lincoln was one of the founders of New North, then Hingham's third parish, when it split from this congregation in 1807. And at the time of the Civil War, Third Parish was the spiritual home of the Commonwealth's Civil War governor, John A. Andrew. I want to thank the Hingham police for their logistical assistance, including leading our procession to Fountain Square after we're done with the ceremony here. And I want to thank Andrea Young and the Hingham Historic Commission for their stewardship of Fountain Square, the Abraham Lincoln statue, and the Benjamin Lincoln marker. I want to thank Harbor Media, which is recording this for those who cannot attend in person. 
And finally, I want to thank Deirdre Anderson and the staff of the Hingham Historical Society who have put together a lot of complicated moving parts for this uh, event today and have arranged for uh, refreshments that you are all invited to enjoy after these proceedings at the Hingham, His Hingham Heritage Museum at Old Derby. And now we will all sing America. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy One, creator of us all, thank you for this day. We welcome you to this place of worship to celebrate the greatness of the human spirit as embodied in two of Hingham's favorite sons. We thank you for all those with us today and we pray for your blessing and guidance in all that we do. May you give strength and confidence to those participating in today's celebration, and may we all listen to and appreciate their efforts. Amen. Each year, the Hingham Historical Society sponsors an eighth grade essay contest. Our thanks to those who assisted us with this con a contest, the Pub Hingham Public Schools Social Studies Director, Andy Hoy, and our volunteer judges, Norma Atkinson, Carolyn Nutt, and Jane Shute. The winners of this year's contest were, third place, Jake Jacob Lewak, second place, Nora Sinnott, and first place, Peyton Burke. So congratulations to them. And now to offer a prayer for the future, Peyton Burke and Jacob Lewa. We come together today in thanksgiving for the many blessings we enjoy in this free land, seeking guidance in the difficulties of the present, yet confident that the future holds and will bestow its own abundant possibilities. We are mindful of the faith and dedication of those who, in the past who dreamt great dreams and saw a vision of a nation as yet unimagined and gave themselves in the struggle to bring into reality what was and is the new order of the ages. May our remembrance of Benjamin and Abraham Lincoln enliver, enliven and endeavor to maintain this new order achieved in our unique nation of states in a birth of freedom. Oh, <laughs> 
May this be our prayer, that our land be blessed with honest industry, sound learning, and high ideals. Save us, Lord, from violence, discord, and confusion, and support us as we seek to fashion into one united people, the multitude brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. May our concern for and remembrance of things of the past lead us not merely to look back, but to the promise of the future and its possibilities. May we in our time be searchers and adventurers, like those to whom we play, pay our tribute, and for those and for whose accomplishments we give thanks to today. Amen. For the presentation of colors and the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to introduce uh, Keith German, Director of v Veterans Affairs for the Town of Hingham. Thank you, Madam President. Hingham, Scout Troop One, post. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of the colors. Hingham, train band, post. Militia, left face. Retreat. March. I'd like to take a moment now to recognize some of the participants in today's celebration and thanking everybody for coming. And if I have forgotten anybody, forgiveness, please. Uh, first, we have here today the Society of the Cincinnati, Massachusetts chapter. The Society of the Cincinnati is a hereditary order of descendants of the military officers of the American Revolution. Benjamin Lincoln founded the Massachusetts chapter of the Society of the Cincinnati. We have the Military Order of the Loyal Legion, Massachusetts Commandery. The Military Order of the Loyal Legion was formed in the immediate aftermath of President Lincoln's assassination and today fosters remembrance and awareness of our 16th president. We welcome the 22nd Massachusetts Voluntary Infantry, a Civil War reenactment organization that portrays Company D of the 22nd Regiment Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Established in 1861, the Massachusetts 22nd became part of the Army of the Potomac and participated in most of the important battles of the Eastern Theater during the Civil War. With them here today are the women of the United States Sanitary Commission, again reenactors of a private relief agency that supported sick and wounded soldiers of the Union Army during the American Civil War. We welcome the ancient and honorable artillery of Massachusetts. Color guard to the Honorable Maura Healy, Governor of the Commonwealth, and the oldest military unit in continuous, uh, continuous activity or continuous existence in, the, in North America. Uh, their, uh, are their, um, their armory is at Faneuil Hall in Boston, where they also uh, run a uh, museum. We welcome the Daughters of the American Revolution, Colonel Thomas Lothrop, Old Colony Chapter. And last but certainly not least, we uh, welcome our own Hingham Militia, the Second Suffolk Regiment, founded in 1637, which means they were just squeaked out by the ancient and honorable by not that many years. 
um, and reactivated in 1974, the Hingham Militia is active in promoting local history through ceremonial and educational purposes. General Lincoln, like his father before him, served in the Hingham Militia. I'd also like to, uh, like to welcome our representative in the general court, Joan Moschino, select board members, Joe Fisher and Bill Ramsey, a town administrator, Tom Mayo. And thank you all for being here. I'd also like to welcome uh, Charlie Woodard and uh, Rose Woodard, uh, the last uh, private occupants of the Benjamin Lincoln House, now a, uh, a, a nascent uh, museum of the Hingham Historical Society. Um, I'd like to recognize select board members Fisher and Ramsey. Town of Hingham, Massachusetts, proclamation. Whereas the town of Hingham was settled in 1635 by a small band of Puritans, many of whom came from Hingham, England, and environs. And whereas among the descendants of those original settlers were two famous American public figures who shared the common family name Lincoln, as well as a common heritage. And whereas it is a long standing Hingham tradition to honor and celebrate their birthdays, General Benjamin Lincoln, a lifelong Hingham citizen and a hero of the American Revolution, and Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president and the towering figure of the Civil War. And whereas we honor and celebrate the lives and deeds and all their complexity of the two Lincolns because of the incredible legacy of civic engagement and community building they have left for us. And whereas, in this year, 2023, we pay special honor to four centuries of our citizens, those famous like Benjamin Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln, and those unknown to history who worked in myriad ways to build and sustain this wonderful community of Hingham and the broader communities of state and nation. And whereas the preservation of community is a perpetual task in which each generation must fully participate. Now, therefore, we, the select board of the town of Hingham, do hereby officially proclaim Saturday, February 11th, 2023, Lincoln Day. Finally, we urge each citizen to take to heart the examples of the two Lincolns and those of four centuries of Hingham citizens. And we urge each citizen to participate in some concrete way in the strengthening and preservation of this community of Hingham and the broader communities of state and nation for the generations which will succeed us. Given under our hands and seal of Hingham, the 17th day of February, 2023, William C. Ramsey Chair, Elizabeth F. Klein, and Joseph M. Fisher. Okay, finally, the main event <laughs> for our Lincoln Day Oration, I'm pleased to introduce Edward Acorn. A newspaper man for 40 years and formerly a prize-winning editorial page editor of the Providence Journal, Edward Acorn is the author of two critically acclaimed books about Abraham Lincoln. His Every Drop of Blood, the momentous second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, was named one of the best books of 2020 by The Economist. His new book, The Lincoln Miracle, Inside the Republican Convention that Changed History is due out on Tuesday. So we are getting, we're getting the inside scoop here today. Um, Ed has come up from Rehoboth to be with us today. And please help me welcome Ed Acorn. Thank you so much. Um, I just can't tell you how much of an honor this is to be here in this, uh, speaking to all of you in this beautiful and historic church. 
about a marvelous man whose ancestry can be traced to this lovely town. Um, your appreciation of history in serious books is something greatly to be admired, and thank you for having me. Uh, Paula mentioned I was a newspaper man for a long time. I wrote incessantly about politics for 41 years, and that's an interesting word, politics. It comes from two words, poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> <laughs> um, So a lot of time in that. But, but it has been my extraordinary privilege in recent years to spend day and night in the company of Abraham Lincoln, immersed in his world and his observations. And I've written two books now about him. Uh, I was trained as a journalist to study uh, intensely for the other side. And I have spent a great deal of time investigating evidence that he was a tyrant and a white supremacist. But I have found that no matter how relentlessly I focus on Lincoln's flaws, this man's honesty, pragmatism, and moral courage shine through. There is a good reason he remains revered. Lincoln told the story about meeting a woman on horseback in the woods. He waited for her to pass, but instead she scrutinized him carefully before saying, well, for land's sake, you were the homeliest man I ever saw. <laughs> Yes, madam, but I can't help it, he replied. No, I suppose not, she said, but you might stay at home. <laughs> I can uh, relate to, this sto to that story as someone whose training was in daily journalism rather than in academia. I have often felt like an interloper in the field of Lincoln scholarship. I might have stayed at home too. At last count, some 16,000 books about Abraham Lincoln have been published, and that's more than about any other human being than Jesus Christ. Um, and how could I dare add anything more? Well, what made me proceed with my 2020 book, Every Drop of Blood, was my feeling that there was a story about Lincoln that had never been told quite this way. In that book, I tell the story of 24 hours in Abraham Lincoln's life from the evening of March 3rd, 1865, through a second inauguration to the evening of March 4th, 1865. And this is a lens through which I think we can see in remarkably sharp detail the monstrous suffering unleashed by the Civil War. And to grasp the ultimate meaning of that war, as Lincoln explained that meaning in his greatest and most profound speech, his second inaugural address. In a lifetime of reading and research about this day, I was struck by uh, the fact that some very famous people keep popping in and out of the story, interacting with Lincoln and with each other, interwoven like a rich tapestry. They include the brilliant black leader, Frederick Douglass, who watched the speech and later discussed it with Lincoln in the reception line at the White House. John Wilkes Booth, the famous actor who stalked Lincoln that day, and may have intended to murder him right there at the Capitol. Walt Whitman, the great American poet who tended to the horribly wounded soldiers in Washington and covered the inaugural for the New York Times. Sam and P. Chase, the mighty Treasury Secretary who had tried to steal the Republican nomination from his own president, but instead as Chief Justice had to swear him into a second term. And Andrew Johnson, the incoming Vice President, who showed up to the inauguration embarrassingly drunk. The perspectives of these very different people provide a powerful and moving view about what this war was about and what Lincoln was up against on that rainy, muddy day in Washington. I tried to weave them into the story. And of course, at the center of it all is Abraham Lincoln. He did something that day that I think no other politician would have. On the cusp of victory after four years of a brutal, divisive, and widely despised war, he declined to make what anyone would expect, a speech celebrating the Union's impending triumph. Instead, he focused on the suffering that war had caused and speculated that such misery might be God's judgment on both sides. The speech is pure Lincoln, brief, moving, unbelievably profound, sonorous with the language of Shakespeare and the King James Bible, steeped in a biblical wisdom about the shortcomings of human beings. 
Lincoln argued in the speech that both sides had been disastrously wrong about the war, that it had proved to be far more destructive than anyone had imagined. And he speculated that the Almighty might have dragged that terrible war out for a purpose foreseen by neither side, to ensure the death of slavery. After all the misery, the devastated mothers, the maimed men writhing on the battlefield and suffering in hospitals, the murder of black prisoners and the starvation of white ones, the brutal insult of Sherman's march, leaving a gaping wound across the South, the hunger and deprivation on the home front, the wretched refugee camps filled with escaped slaves with no means of support or education, Lincoln argued that it was time for Americans to stop thinking about self-righteousness. The only way forward was to recognize that all had been wrong, to set aside hatred and vengeance, and to treat each other with mercy, with malice toward none, with charity for all. I think that a very narrow focus on a historical event can give us an understanding that the usual omniscient historical view cannot. It brings us very close to the ground, instead of viewing everything from 30,000 feet up. Studied that way, I find historical figures almost magically become flesh and blood, real human beings, subject to the emotions we feel and other vicissitudes, including the politics of the moment. It becomes clearer they were groping in the dark and had no idea how things would turn out. With this forced perspective, we also get a stronger sense of how everything looked, sounded, and smelled. I adopted this approach, which some called microhistory, in my new book, The Lincoln Miracle, which, as Paula mentioned, is out on Tuesday. This time we go back five years before the inauguration to one week in Chicago in May 1860. In those days, party conventions chose the presidential candidates instead of our modern system of primaries. Given crippling divisions in the Democratic Party between North and South, Republicans who gathered in Chicago knew they had a realistic chance of nominating the next president of the United States. How Lincoln rose to that position, I consider one of the real miracles of American history. Lincoln went in as the darkest of dark horses. He had lost two elections for the US Senate and had not held public office in more than a decade. An Illinois paper said of him, in everything Lincoln undertakes politically, he seems doomed to failure. He has been prostrated enough in his political schemes to have crushed the life out of an ordinary man. Lincoln had almost no formal education and his country mannerisms struck many people as quaint at best. He told dirty jokes. His executive experience was pretty much limited to running a two-man law office. Lincoln himself had told people he did not think himself fit for the presidency. And two years earlier, he declared with roaring laughter, just think of such a sucker as me as president. In fact, Lincoln's chances seemed so remote that the leaders of the Republican National Committee approved Chicago as the convention in site in part because they thought it was neutral ground. No serious candidate hailed from Illinois. In those days, the candidates did not show up at the convention. Lincoln was such a long shot that he contemplated going, telling a friend that he felt he was too much of a candidate to go and not quite enough to stay home. In the end, fortunately, he stayed home in Springfield. On May 12, 1860, when the book begins, Harper's Weekly published a centerpiece with pictures of all the candidates. It played Lincoln's picture small with the also-rans. It ran its written description of him dead last among all the candidates. At best, people were talking about Lincoln as possible vice presidential nominee, only because he was from an important swing state. Front and center with the biggest picture and the first and longest write-up was the superstar of the Republican Party, the former governor of New York and current U.S. Senator William Seward. Seward was regarded as the father of the Republican Party, a bold opponent of slavery, a defender of the rights of immigrants, and he was managed and funded by a brilliant political strategist named Thurlow Weed, who could make or break senators and presidents. Seward had traveled to Europe several months before the convention, where he capped his preparation for the presidency 
by meeting with world leaders, including Queen Victoria, Pope Pius IX, France's Emperor Napoleon III. When he returned, he was mobbed by Americans who wanted him to be president. He was far and away the most popular candidate with the delegates gathering in Chicago. But his strength was deceptive. The previous October, much of the nation had been horrified by the act of a militant abolitionist named John Brown, who raided a federal armory to provide slaves with guns for a violent insurrection. Many Americans thought all the slavery talk was putting an unbearable strain on the political system, threatening to break the nation in two and ignite civil war. And nobody was more famous for anti-slavery rhetoric, rhetoric than William Seward, Though Lincoln had made some of the same points against slavery, he was far less known to the voters. So many practical Republicans were getting awfully nervous about running Seward. On top of that, Seward had openly supported immigrants and was, a, was close to Catholic leaders, something that turned off a sizable portion of the Republican base, who feared that rampant immigration was helping Democrats steal elections and destroying America from within. Former members of the American party, who often called the Know Nothing Party, might well bolt from the Republicans if they nominated Seward. Lincoln was safer. His position on immigrants was so little known that some people assumed he was a Know Nothing. In truth, he despised the movement. He liked to tell a story about a man who helped with his gardening, an Irish immigrant named Patrick. When Lincoln asked him why he had not been born in America, Pat replied, faith, Mr. Lincoln, I wanted to be, but me mother wouldn't let me. <laughs> One of the mo most striking things that became clear in my research was that these men gathered in Chicago were not choosing a candidate on the basis of who would make the best president in a terrible national crisis. Their biggest concern by far was who could get the most Republicans elected securing power, jobs, and money. The pro-Lincoln Chicago Press and Tribune appealed to this naked self-interest in an editorial that week aimed at arriving delegates. Constables are worth more than presidents in the long run as a means of holding political power. We look to Mr. Lincoln to tow constables and state general assembly members into power. The gods help those who help themselves. Early in the convention, the strongest moderate to alternative to Seward appeared to be a Missouri judge named Edward Bates. He hated slavery agitation, and his backers argued he would calm the South and negate all threats of secession. Bates had the backing of some powerful forces, including the most influential newspaper editor in the country, Horace Greeley, who was angry at Seward and Weed for blocking his political career. Unfortunately for Bates, German immigrants were dead set against him because he had flirted with the Know Nothing Party. Prominent Germans went so far as to hold their own national convention that same week in Chicago, just down the road from the Republican one, sending a terrifying signal to the delegates. German immigrants made up only a small percentage of Republican voters, but they were enough to sway elections in many northern states. The delegates thus did not dare go with Bates. So all these things, John Brown, the know-nothings, the Germans, Greeley's revenge against Seward, the location of the convention, all of it slotted perfectly into place for Lincoln. Seward's manager, Thurlow Weed, understood crowd psychology, and he brought thousands of supporters with him by train to Chicago. They led huge parades in the streets and filled the convention hall called the Wigwam all creating a vivid impression of the inevitability of Seward's nomination. Lincoln's team was puny by comparison. It was led by a good friend, David Davis, a 300-pound judge who traveled the central Illinois judicial circuit with Lincoln for six months out of every year. When Davis showed up in Chicago, he discovered that the Lincoln campaign was so badly organized, nobody had even booked a room to serve as its headquarters. Davis immediately took command of the campaign without any formal appointment. For the next five days, he did not go to bed. On Thursday evening, the delegates had not settled on an alternative to Seward, 
The New Yorker had won a series of test votes that day and appeared ready to win the nomination when another miracle occurred. The tally sheets for voting had not yet arrived at the podium, and the delegates were so hungry at that point that they decided to adjourn and vote the next day rather than wait just a few minutes. For a want of tally sheets, Seward was not nominated that evening. On such slender threads hang the fate of nations. The Lincoln men worked hard that night. Judge Davis countered Seward's psychological advantages by finding champion shouters and positioning them around the hall for, for maximum effect. And somebody on the team managed to print counterfeit admission tickets to the wigwam, forging them overnight. After the Seward forces staged a grand parade with marching bands, they arrived at the wigwam Friday morning to find their seats occupied by Lincoln men who were plentiful in Chicago. The shouting of the Lincoln supporters would create an illusion of great strength. Davis had also worked through the night selling cabinet positions and other choice offices for support. Lincoln sent a message warning his supporters to make no deals in his name. Davis told his team, Lincoln ain't here. <laughs> Don't know what we have to meet, so we will go ahead as if we hadn't heard from him, and he must ratify it. Davis spent the night effectively bribing state delegations. In fact, he confessed later that he promised some offices to more than one delegation. <laughs> you must have prevaricated somewhat, a friend responded to his story. Prevaricated? Davis replied, prevaricated? We lied like hell. <laughs> the nomination of Lincoln on the third ballot astounded the nation and the people in the hall. He had turned out to be the candidate who was as bitterly opposed to slavery as Seward, thus appealing to the party's base, but was much less famous and thus not as scary to voters. And unlike Bates, he was not offensive to immigrant voters. The delegates also thought his rags to riches story from a log cabin to the White House would appeal to voters, but the delegates had no real idea of Lincoln's greatness of the political savvy, moral courage, humanity, pragmatism, literary brilliance, and powers of endurance that would soon prove crucial to the nation's survival. None of the other candidates were so equipped. A reporter on the scene at the Wigwam later wrote, they had nominated the plain, everyday, storytelling, mirth-provoking Lincoln of the hustings, the husk only of the Lincoln of history. It took four fear, fearful years to give the event its true relations and right proportions. And it was not until the veil was drawn by an assassin's hand that the real Lincoln was revealed. He concluded that the delegates had been the unconscious instruments of a higher power. In other words, this was a miracle. A final observation. Today we honor the great Lincolns of Hingham, Benjamin and Samuel Lincoln, Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln knew of great Lincolns back in Massachusetts. In 1856, he was hanging out with Judge Davis and fellow lawyers on the circuit when somebody read in the newspaper that some delegates at the first Republican National Convention had voted for Lincoln for vice president. I reckon that ain't me, Lincoln said. There's another great man in Massachusetts named Lincoln, and I reckon it's him. It turned out to be Abe Lincoln, though he wasn't nominated. We also honor today John Albion Andrew, the Civil War governor of Massachusetts. As I write in my new book, Andrew was one of the leading delegates who traveled down to Springfield from Chicago the day after the convention to formally notify Lincoln of his nomination. Ushered into Lincoln's parlor, he was struck immediately, like so many others, by Lincoln's appearance. Quote, my eyes were never feasted with the vision of a human face in which more transparent honesty and more benignant kindness were combined with more of the intellect and firmness which belonged to masculine humanity, he said a few days later. When Andrew got his turn to shake Lincoln's hand, he quipped that Massachusetts could claim him as one of, his son, of its sons, since the Lincoln name was an old one in Plymouth County. We'll consider it so this evening, Lincoln replied. 
I'm greatly honored to be here today in the town that can indeed claim Lincoln as one of its sons. And I thank you all. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, we're now going to end by standing uh, to sing America the Beautiful. As we leave this place, we thank God for each and every one gathered here this morning. May the Lord continue to dwell in our hearts for all our days, and may we be a light for others. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.
Carry the colors. Present arms.